welcome to Shut Up and See Something. I am your host and creator of the show, Deidre Daniel. This podcast is all about how to live a more fascinating life. And we're learning how to do that one interesting conversation at a time. We try to stay away from discussing politics, religion, and the ad nauseum topic du jour, but sometimes it creeps in and then we just sneak our way back out again. But anything else is fair game. And today I am speaking with Dr. Louis Rosenberg. He is a pioneer in the field of virtual reality, augmented reality, and artificial intelligence. He developed the first augmented reality system for Air Force Research Laboratory in 1992. And then he founded the early virtual reality company Immersion Corporation in 1993 and took it public. He is currently CEO of Unanimous AI, a company that amplifies the intelligence of human groups. He holds a PhD from Stanford and has been awarded over 300 patents for his innovations, which is 300 more than I have. I met Lewis virtually towards the end of 2017. I had decided that I wanted to leave Geico after being there for almost two decades, and I thought, it's time for a career change. I want to do something different, and I made a list of different industries that I would like to be a part of, and AI was one of them. Something caught my attention. I don't know if it was a TEDx that he had delivered or an article that I read or maybe a combination thereof, but I found him and all of the work that he was doing in AI And I thought, I want to work for that guy. So I reached out to him on LinkedIn and he kindly accepted my connection request. And then I pitched him why he should hire me. And he predictably pushed me over to someone else on his team to manage me and my overtures. But not to be brushed aside, I decided he needed to meet me in person. And I was out in Los Angeles for a meeting and I told a friend of mine David Layton, who is the president of Women in Technology International, that I wanted to get some face time with Lewis. And so he offered to drive me up to see Lewis. But Lewis lives in Northern California. That is at least a three-hour drive. But just trying to get out of LA could be anywhere from three hours to a day anyway. So this was like a real adventure. And so I started telling other people about it. I wanted to meet this man named Lewis, and I told them all about the articles I read, and they all became fascinated, and so they wanted to come too. So suddenly, it was like Dorothy with a bunch of characters off to see the Wizard of Oz. So I told Lewis I had a friend who wanted to drive me up there to take him out to dinner, and after a really, really long silence, he told me he was busy. Over the years, I continued to enthusiastically tell others about Lewis and his company, Unanimous AI. I never got to meet him in person, but five years later, he is the guest on my 11th episode of my new podcast. And here we are. Welcome, Lewis. Yes. Thanks for having me. And thanks for not holding it against me that I was uh, busy back in 2017. I seem to be busy every year. I am just very busy. (laughs) Yes, I'm I'm sure you are. I I do wonder, though, did you think I was Annie Wilkes from the movie Misery? (laughs) I actually actually did not think that. I, I did think that you were doing interesting. I mean, I followed the, the work that you've done since 2017 because we've stayed in touch and you've done lots of interesting things. Your game, your it seems like every every year there's another interesting thing that uh, you come up with that I have to read and see what it's all about. Oh, well, I appreciate that. But you know, I I am your number one fan, Lewis. <laughs> So today's episode is all about the metaverse, and I can't stress enough how important this information is for you and your future. Uh, So settle in, take some notes. We're going to start with the basics to catch some of you up, and then we're going to dive deeper. So the first question is, what is the metaverse, and how is that different from AR, VR, and just like a massive video game that a bunch of people play where they're wasting their money on cartoon plots of land? So it's a great question, and it's a question that confuses a lot of people. They hear the word metaverse, and there's a lot of definitions out there. And for some reason, like most people who are giving definitions seem like they try to be confusing. And mm-hmm. I think it's useful. I think it's useful to actually just keep it really simple, which is, you know, to me, the metaverse is this societal transition from a world that's based right now mostly on flat media viewed in the third person to a world that will be mostly immersive media experienced in the first person. Mm -hmm. And, um, And that transition is starting, it's accelerating, 
it will lead to what I consider to be kind of two different flavors of the metaverse. There'll be a, a virtual metaverse, which is simulated worlds with avatars, uh, people wearing virtual reality glasses. Uh -huh. And then there'll be an augmented metaverse, which is the real world embellished with virtual content that you see all around you. And, mm -hmm. and so whether it's a, a virtual metaverse or an augmented metaverse, it's just important to just realize that this is this fundamentally changes the role of the user. Right now, the user is an outsider looking in at content through a little window called the screen. And the metaverse will change the user to an active participant that is, experiences content in the first hand. And the reason that I get excited about it is that we humans evolved to experience our world in the first person. It's how we understand things. It's how we learn things. It's how we build intuition. It's how we build connections with other people. It's first person experiences. And we you know, often forget that in computers up, you know, for the last 50, 60 years have really forced users to be uh, on the outside looking in at content and finally, the world is making that change to allow us to be on the inside and, and it will open up all kinds of opportunities. It sounds like instead of the user being passive, absorbing the information, they're becoming sort of part of it. Instead of being, a, you know, instead of content being viewed, mm -hmm. it's really being experienced. And mm -hmm. so, you, you know, you, you're becoming an active participant in an experience rather than a passive viewer of content. Yeah. So how do you even get into the metaverse world? Like, where is it? So it's, I mean, you know, there's been a lot of hype around the metaverse. It really, you know, it started when Facebook changed their name to Meta late yeah. last year. Mm -hmm. And and so there's a lot of energy and excitement about it. But for most people, it doesn't really exist. Meaning there's not, there's not lots of platforms where people would be using the metaverse. There's lots of corporations working hard to develop it. But really, I would say that the metaverse, and the other thing that's worth answering in, your, in this question is that you ask the question kind of in the singular, which is like, where is the metaverse? Yeah. And because the word the is in it. So you say like, well, it's a singular. Well, yeah. really, it's it's not a singular thing, at least not, not yet. And it might never be. There's, you know, I look at it as there will be metaverse platforms, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, Meta now has a metaverse platform called Horizon World, and people can go join Horizon World, and it's a you know it's a virtual world. There will be other metaverse platforms from other large companies that will either be fully virtual, like Horizon World, or augmented, uh, where it's the real world with content all around you. I my personal view is that these platforms will be pretty separate because that's just the way corporations are. They mm -hmm. each you know, create their own world. And, and I think there'll be Meta's Horizon world and Apple uh, will have their own world and Google will have their own world and Sony and Samsung. These different virtual worlds will coexist. There'll be some crossover between, but it'll be kind of similar to how we think of social media platforms. Like if somebody, if you ask the question like, well, where is social media? Well, right. social media exists in Facebook and in Twitter and in, and, you know, is there crossover? Yes, but they're separate platforms. Uh, the one exception to that, I would say, is the augmented metaverse. A and I say that because the, the augmented metaverse, you know, we all share the same physical world, right? <laughs> like there's a physical world and the augmented world will be overlaid on it. And the companies that are pushing augmented reality are not the social media companies like, you know, Facebook and Instagram, Twitter. They're really the the cell phone companies, the mobile, the, the, the mobile media companies, the Apples and Googles and Samsungs. And, and the thing about the, the world of phones is that it really is, if you have an Apple phone, you can call a, a Google, you know, Android. They're, you don't think of them as two separate platforms. You just think of them as, you know, the world right. of phones. Mm -hmm. And I think I personally think augmented reality would be the same thing. So you might buy augmented re reality glasses from Apple or from Google or from Samsung or Sony. And when you walk down the street, you will see the same content uh, around you. There'll be, you know, there'll be one augmented world that, uh, that people can experience. I, I think that's very likely. Whereas when you're thinking of purely virtual worlds, there'll be separate platforms like, like today's social media platforms are, are separate see. platforms. 
I see. Is everyone going to be tripping and falling wearing these glasses as they're distracted by all this content they're interacting with as they walk down the street and billboards are talking to them? And I think it's actually the opposite, meaning, you know, if you think of today's world, we're living in a world of flat media. People are walking down the street, you know, staring down at a phone, you know, bumping into things because the, the content is in their hand, whereas in an augmented world where you're wearing, you're just lightweight glasses, like any glasses, the content will just be naturally integrated into your surroundings. And so mm-hmm. it will be, you know, people will have their heads up again as they walk down the street as, a, as opposed to staring down at a screen. I think it actually will be a, a more natural and uh, an intuitive experience. Now, you could certainly imagine it being out of control with content and and it being of this noisy world. I think people won't stand for that. I think that users will turn off will turn it off if it's if it's this noisy, distracting world. I think what what users will want is a world where the the content is there when they want it. Uh, if they look at things, it will be easy to bring up and it will be seamlessly integrated. And so you could imagine you're walking down the street and you, you know, you see an old building and you think, oh, that's like, that's interesting building. And, you know, maybe, you know, with a, you know, with a little selection with your hand, you suddenly see historical content about that building, or Mm -hmm. maybe you're, you're interested, you know, are there apartments for rent in that building and you see it and, you know, they get overlaid and you see, oh, there's three apartments. So, so the information that you want about your world will be placed in the location where it's useful as opposed to looking down at a screen and then looking back up at the building and trying to say like, well, where is that apartment? You'll just see like that window will be highlighted. That's the apartment that's for rent. Mm-hmm. And so it can, it can be a way that presents information to people in the way we were meant to receive it, which is like, spatial. like predators. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> we're sizing up everything we see. Like it, you could, you could certainly look at it that way. Right. And, and I don't, I don't see it as, you know, people see, you know, people seeing crosshairs in their, in their world. And, and uh, I see it as they see uh, everyone's temperature. So, so there's, there is certainly this dark side that you could, that you could go to. And it's something that, that I worry a lot about the dark side of it, the, the, the negative uses uh-huh. uh, to me, the negative uses are, are less likely to come from individuals who want to see everybody's temperature or have, you know, I think uh, to me, the, the dark side is really more from the fact that there are going to be these large corporations that control the technology, control the platforms, and the technology itself by its very nature is going to give these corporations the ability to know everything about us, right? Like we already feel that way. It's going to make today's world seem kind of quaint because in today's world, when you worry about privacy, let's say for social media, Mm-hmm. You know, you know that the, the platforms can track, you know, what you're clicking on, who your friends are, maybe what you're buying. They're, they're gathering information about you. They're profiling you. It's it's very intrusive. In the metaverse, they'll now be able to know everything that you're doing. They're going to know uh, as you walk down the street in a virtual or augmented world. They're going to know where you are, who you're with, what you're doing, what you're looking at. They're going to know how long your gaze happens to linger on this thing versus that thing. They're going to know as you as you gaze into a store window that you know what store you're looking at. And so the the ability of these platforms to track everything, including your temperature and your heart rate and your blood pressure and your facial expressions and your vocal inflections, everything is going to be inherent in the metaverse. And, and my personal view is that there really needs to be regulations to prevent that information from being used in you know, what I would call creepy, creepy ways. <laughs> um, yeah, what are some creepy ways? I, I hear a lot of times people will say things along the lines of, well, I don't care. I'm not doing anything wrong. They can collect whatever information they want about me. And I think, well, what if you're not able to get a job because the people in that company don't want someone who does X, whatever X is, or a data scientist has studied and figured out some sort of correlation between someone who buys these kind of sneakers and what kind of employee they're going to be. I mean, you don't know, but what do you foresee is like the evil behind gathering this information and not controlling it the way it needs to be? So 
the the types of things that you that you mentioned are are real concerns. They're privacy concerns. It, those privacy concerns exist today with data. You can collect large amounts of data about people, and then with the use of AI, you can find patterns in that data, and those patterns might be used against you. Right? Those patterns might say oh, this person is lazy because of some pattern seen in the data that nobody would have, and it's hard to, to get hired. Or uh, this person is bad with money, so they're not going to get a loan for some, because of some pattern in the data. And, and that, I mean, that problem exists today <laughs> with, sure. with your social, well, social, I, me social media data. Right, right. I read somewhere in a lot of like um, developing countries where people don't have traditional credit scores that uh, some data scientists determined that they could study the way you use your cell phone. So if you never let your battery die, you are more credit worthy than someone who allows the, the battery to completely drain out. And if you have phone calls with several people on a regular basis at a certain length of time, it meant that you had real relationships and therefore were more likely to pay your loan back. And they were doing this for like $500 loans just by determining how you use your cell phone. I mean, that's for $500. But what other what other things are you thinking? That's a great example that you gave about cell, you know, cell phone charging. It's But there's lots of examples like that. People can, uh, there's examples where in what seems like pretty benign data, uh, when it's analyzed by AI, it can detect, you know, depression, it can detect mental illness, it can detect, you know, people who are irresponsible. And, and those, you know, those are things that could be useful if you're if you're using it with your doctor, but it, you certainly don't want it used by in employers or it, that's private information. So there's there's those privacy concerns, and that exists today. In the metaverse, it gets worse because the amount of data that gets collected will be infinitely more intimate. It will know everything you're doing uh, from the time you enter these uh, environments to the time you you leave these environments. But there's also the issue of well, what are the what will the corporations do with this information? And I'm not, I'm not you know beyond the potential negative uses of this for things like hiring. If you think about social media, the social media platforms, their business, their business model is to track and profile their users and then to use those profiles to sell advertising to third parties. And selling advertising is really selling persuasion. They're, they're saying, here's what I know about this person, uh, message that person and persuade them. In the metaverse, if they can use uh, information about your facial expressions, your vocal inflections, your blood pressure, and use that with advertising, advertisers in real time. So now advertisers in the metaverse uh, can adjust their advertisements in real time based on how your blood pressure is changing during that advertisement or, or how your facial expressions are changing in real time. Like That will happen in the metaverse. We will have these, because again, in the metaverse, an advertisement won't be flat media. It will be an immersive experience. So instead of me just, you know, watching a video, it will be, there'll be a virtual spokesperson who is telling me about, you know, this new, uh, this new product or service, this new car. And if that virtual spokesperson is adjusting its tactics in real time, <laughs> based on my blood pressure or my heart rate or my facial expressions using AI, that, you know, that will be the most persuasive form of technology, you know, that's ever been developed. And, and the reason that I worry about it is if AI systems right now can beat the world's best chess players and poker players and Go players, what chance do we have as a consumer if, if an AI is in real time adjusting its tactics to influence us and it's reading our facial expressions and reading our blood pressure and adjusting in ways that no human salesperson could do. Like these things will happen. They're not that far away unless it's regulated, unless we say, you know, the metaverse is really cool, but you know, advertisers shouldn't be able to be, you know, reading your blood pressure in real time to, to optimize the persuasiveness of their message. They shouldn't be reading your facial expressions in real time and your vocal inflections to optimize the, the message because this combination of immersive natural experiences and AI that can look at all this data can be, you know, it can be abused. It, it can be, you know, right. a predatory so, but, form of advertising. Well, it's not just advertising. What if 
and I don't like to get political, so we're going to tap dance in and probably tap dance out. Couldn't governments convince you to act and think a certain way then? So absolutely. So any form of messaging. So, and it's, to me, it's really scary because in the metaverse, we have this world where everything you're doing is being tracked. So there's all this information. It could generate these behavioral profiles of people, how they it can predict how you behave. It'll generate these emotional profiles of people, predict you know, how they will respond. And at the same time, the metaverse, the, the platform providers can change what you see. Right? It can change what you see, what you hear, can manipulate the world around you. Mm-hmm. And so if you have this world where uh, the system knows everything about you and it can change the world around you. Change your reality. It, it can change your reality. Right. So, mm. so I could be, and, and the thing is the reality that I, that I see and the reality that you see aren't necessarily the same, right? Like just like targeted advertising in social media, we, we're getting different news feeds. We're getting uh-huh. different advertisements. In the metaverse, I'll be walking down the street and I might see a, a virtual car drive by and I might think that's just a car. I might not realize that's a targeted advertisement that was put in there for me to see. I might see somebody walking down the street drinking a Red Bull and think, oh, that's, you know, I just happened to notice that. And I see another one and another one. And I might think, oh, like Red Bull is really popular in this town because this could be in the, a real augmented world. And I might not realize, that, no. Uh, Red Bull is targeting me with these yeah. virtual product placements and it's changing my reality because the, the metaverse will ultimately get so real. I won't be able to tell the difference between an authentic experience and a, and a targeted virtual experience on behalf of a sponsor. Yeah, but and Lewis, so- eventually people won't be able to tell the difference between right and wrong because it's being scripted <laughs> for them. So, I mean, absolutely. So, so the... The ability of these platforms to uh, to track people and then target people and and give this uh, manipulative information is really dangerous. It should be regulated, and like you said, it could be used by advertisers. It could also be used by governments. Yeah, it could be used uh, as the you know the most persuasive form of propaganda you could imagine. So I could right you, right. You, you, well, hold on. This is like the Minority Report, though. So are we also then going to predict? Oh, you're a criminal in the future. So let's just go ahead and arrest you now. So I mean, AI is already being used for uh, for sen- for giving sentencing recommendations to people, and and it's really doing that. It's saying it's looking at their their you know their background based not based on what anything they did, just based on what their the patterns in their data happen to look like other people uh-huh. and, and make predictions of, you know, is this person going to be a repeat offender or not? And it's, um, you know, that data is filled with bias. It, it again, it's, it gets closer to this idea of minority report. And, you know, when we get into the metaverse, the quantity of data that ev- is collected about every person it will be so much more extensive that it, you know, these types of kind of predictive capabilities, whether it's predicting somebody's potential for criminal activity or predicting their ability to pay back a loan, or most likely predicting what messaging is going to make you buy a product that you don't need. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and I say that because most of the, there's a lot of activity in this space. There's a lot of companies working in this space. They're mostly working on it for advertising. They're working on it to say, okay, how can I use somebody's facial expressions to persuade them to buy this product or buy this service that right. much more effectively? But exactly like you said, those same capabilities could be used to, to persuade you about misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, any kind of messaging. It, it doesn't have to be, you know, you know, what sports drink to buy. Well, why would anyone go in there at this point? Like why go into the metaverse if it's going to completely mess with your brain the whole time so i mean i it's a real worry and and for me as somebody who's you know i've been involved in this technology for for 30 years from the beginning and there's all kinds of really amazing magical things that can be used for i mean and we can talk about we can talk about all those magical things but at the same time there's all these you know really serious concerns and so my my hope and my push and one of the things i'm really active in doing is raising awareness about the problems and pushing for regulation Mm -hmm. regulation uh, not of the creative people in, who are working on the metaverse, regulation of the platforms that sit in the middle and have access to all this data and then potentially sell this data to the highest bidder for persuading people. If there Lewis, was, that it, seems like you wouldn't be a friend of certain companies and industries. Do you have bodyguards? <laughs> it seems so like they would want to sell this data and you're trying to block them. 
It's an interesting question because if you look at social media, I mean, social media is a great historical example of, of a technology that started out such that we you know, felt like it had these utopian abilities. It's going to bring the world together. It's going to, it's going to democratize the world. It's, it's going to empower people. And it, it actually does all those things. But at the same time, it's the businesses that, that run social media, their business model is advertising. And so they, became, they got into this arms race to see who can be the best at tracking and profiling people and then selling access to people to the highest bid. And so in social media, the, the users are, are not the customers. They're actually the product, right? right. You're the product you're being sold. Yeah. And so that's, it's the business model that drove these corporations to go in that direction. And in the metaverse, the business models have not been developed yet. And so if regulations can be put in place, guardrails can be put in place, these platforms won't become reliant on that same model. And, and so the question is, well, is that a good thing for these, for these companies? Maybe. Do we really think that when the large companies uh, created social media platforms 15 years ago, that they really wanted to be in the business of tracking and profiling people and then selling access to those people? That, that's, like, that's probably not what their motivation was. They ended up in, a, in an industry where advertising became the convention, and then they ended up in an arms race with other companies to become mm -hmm. the best at these capabilities. Yeah. And now they have they they have very negative reputations among the general public because of this business model which maybe wasn't even their choice. <laughs> but they it's probably the had to make the shareholders happy. They had to keep growing and how do you keep generating revenue and so it's that I mean, was the way to do it. And consumers didn't want to pay they didn't want to pay subscriptions for social media. They wanted it for free. Uh -huh. And they were willing and and so there's this system that got created for social media that has, and again, social media has really positive aspects to it, but it also has this dark side, mostly from the business model. And the metaverse has the potential to go in the exact same direction, but we have some hindsight now about, about what happened with social media. And we can say, you know what, it had social media had some regulation early on and limited the amount of tracking and profiling and, and advertising and social media those companies still would have found successful business models and they probably wouldn't have the negative reputations that they have today. And so it's actually in the industry's best interest if the metaverse has some guardrails so they don't have to be in an arms race to see who can be the best at tracking people's blood pressure and selling that to advertisers in real time. Because mm -hmm. if there aren't guardrails, that's what's going to happen. These companies are going to be, they're going to become the best possible machines for tracking, you know, figuring out your emotions every minute of the day and figuring out how your emotions are changing as you have these promotional experiences and it will become dystopian. But if there are guardrails in place, they can focus on, uh, instead of being the best at selling and persuasion to advertisers, they could become the best at creating, you know, magical, amazing experiences for users and the users could actually be the customer because again these immersive experiences you know are remarkable for entertainment and for education and uh, you know I was uh, I was down in LA a few days ago uh, visiting a, a, a virtual reality company that focuses on uh, entertainment experiences and we went into their system and they took us down it was by a lot a biology lesson that we could actually go into the bloodstream and actually see uh, see blood cells and, and it looked like you were really there and you could see that's um, like that movie with randy quaid right when he was yeah, do you remember uh, do you remember uh, that it, movie it was inner inner space maybe uh, yeah called? i think so i think i think that was the name of it yeah where he yeah, was no, dipping you through. Can, i mean that's so neat yeah there are really amazing applications um whether it's allowing people to watch sports as if they're really on the field or right on the edge of the field, mm -hmm. uh, allowing people to you know, learn biology by going inside of the body, allowing people to learn you know, history by going back into the past and really feeling those things. You know, my hope is that we can really push towards those uses and you know, put some guardrails in place so that we, we are not tainting this potential with you know, the same kind of tracking and targeting and manipulating that, that has made social media, you know, this mixed bag of, you know, yes, there's, there's positive applications, but it's also a machine for, you know, for spreading 
misinformation and disinformation right. and, and doing these negative things. Mm -hmm. Do you remember choose your own adventure books? Do you remember yeah, those? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just always thought it would be so good for teenagers now to have an immersive experience where they make these life decisions and they see how it ends up and then they backtrack like, okay, let me, let me try again. And because this is where I want to end up. So these are the steps I need to take to get there. And, and what a great way to teach those long-term goals and, and all that and, and to show them what the outcome would be. So let's pretend you've worked, you've made a lot of friends that are willing to make these adjustments and put up the guardrails. And now this is all, you know, an immersive experience for good. What sort of things could like a small business do in the metaverse that would help their business? So if I'm a small mom and pop ice cream stand or, you know, a bar or a hotel, what would I do to interact with people? How would that help? my company. Right. So I think you can go back to the really simple definition and say, you know, the metaverse is this transition from flat media viewed in the third person to immersive media experienced in the first person. And so whatever your, your business is right now, you have a, a very likely have a presence online and you're showing flat media. If you're a hotel, you're showing you know, flat images, photographs of hotel of your hotel uh -huh. rooms. So as we transition to the metaverse, all of these businesses will, will basically have a virtual showroom where people can see their products and services immersively. So if somebody could, wants to see what a hotel is like. hold on, Lewis, like, it sounds so expensive. I know for so many people, their marketing budgets are so tight and they were able to post some photos on Facebook and that was the best they could do. And then now there's this metaverse and they need to have 3D imaging of, of whatever to, to upload. It just sounds expensive. It I know. sounds expensive, but it won't be. And, okay. and it's, I mean, at the early days of the internet, it also sounded expensive. Like, oh, you have to have a web page. Yeah. And, and now, I've gotta, now I've got to put pictures on my web. I got to get a digital, what's a digital camera? Like yeah. that's, how, that, I mean, that's how it was for, for small businesses at the start of the internet. Mm -hmm. um, now it's actually, I think, less of a cultural change now because uh, small businesses already, you know, have an online presence. Instead, the question is, you know, having 3D instead of 2D. But the large companies are going to make that a relatively painless. I mean, App I think Apple will be the, the leader there. Apple already is putting LiDAR into their phones, which is basically a, a 3D scanning technology. And so uh -huh. with, with current Apple phones and with LiDAR, you can actually scan a room and make a 3D model. And, and that will be all the hardware that you need. I'm sure that uh, Android phones will have the same thing. And then some of the large, say, furniture makers are already going in this direction as well. So IKEA uh, has virtual showrooms mm -hmm. uh, and they envision a world where you as the consumer can scan your room, like let's say scan your living room and then see what the IKEA furniture would look like in that room in in a virtual or augmented world. Mm -hmm. And so the larger corporations will do it first uh, whether it's Okia and, and Home Depot is doing it and so, some of the other larger entities, but it will be inexpensive enough and cheap enough and easy enough that small businesses will be able to do it as well. Yeah. And, and you know, the downside is that they'll ultimately feel like they have to do it, right? Like it would, like none of these things end up being a choice <laughs> because if your competitors, you know, have a, you know, a 3D showroom of whatever product or service you're selling, you will feel like you have to do that as well. Mm. Um, it is the direction that it's that it's going, and it, it, but that's more that's more augmented reality, right? Like, what about right? Like, that's more well, augmented yeah. reality. So it, you're it seeing, depends. Okay. So, so augmented reality would be if I can, you know, if I have glasses and I look around my real living room, and then I can see what a piece of furniture from a certain brand looks like in that living room, and, and so that's augmented reality. If you're if you are a hotel selling hotel rooms, and I want to see, well, what what does it look like inside that? Or, that hotel room, that particular room that I want to rent, I could actually see, oh, this is what it looks like in that room, that exact room. This is what the view looks like out the window. I mean, that that will happen. That's how hotel and that, rooms- And that'll be in the metaverse. That will be in the, that will be, you know, a virtual reality experience. Um, I see. Okay. And you have to have headgear for this kind of stuff? So you do. Uh, uh -huh. You have to have headgear. Uh, you know, I'm personally skeptical that people will want to spend huge amounts of time in what I would call the virtual metaverse, where you're wearing kind of a bulky headset uh -huh. and it, it cuts you off from the real world. I think that those purely virtual experiences will become popular for short duration socializing, short duration 
shopping, short duration entertainment. I could see, you know, just like just like watching a movie is a short duration activity or watching sports is a short duration activity. I think people will, will use headsets for those short amounts of time, but for spending long periods of time, I really think it's augmented reality where the glasses will just be lightweight glasses like any uh-huh. other glasses and the content will not cut you off from your real world. You'll be in the real world. You'll just have access to information that is helpful or interesting or artistic. I mean, you, the augmented world will be in, you know, a artistic embellished world mm-hmm. that also has informational content. And as long as we, you know, it doesn't get overrun with promotional content, it will be a positive experience. I, I think if it gets overrun with promotional content, people will will turn away from it. Yeah, I invented a, a device that helps people build stories, and it's in the back of my upcoming book. And there's an augmented reality component where they can. Uh, put their phone over a QR code and then it'll animate and uh-huh. they can manipulate it on their phone. And originally I wanted it to be like an actual toy that people uh-huh. would use. And then I realized this is a much easier way to distribute that right. than trying to have a plastic mold and, you know, put this together and then, you know, distribute that be hard. So. Yeah, no, that's, uh, yeah. I mean, I, that's a great application. It's an application that uses today's phones. So there's not, you don't have to uh, mm-hmm. wait for an installed base of, people, of other hardware and, um, and it will just make, you know, it brings the book to life in a new, in a new way. And you don't have to ship anything. <laughs> right. Yeah. A few years ago, I volunteered for a symphony uh, in town, the Lakeland Imperial Symphony Orchestra. And I thought, how cool would it be if people are listening to this concert, listening to this music, but then they could hold their phone up and then see like a whale swimming through the audience or what have you. I mean, that would really modernize this classical experience and bring in new fans. Absolutely. And I think we'll, we will see a lot of experiences like that. And I think in terms of like when and how that will happen, if you have to hold your phone up to see it, it will be kind of a little bit of a gimmick. But if you if people have glasses that they can wear, Sure. Like 3D uh, glasses. They would hand right. them out just like they would at a, right. at a movie theater, but they're but pretty expensive have, right now. Right. So they are. But, you know, in terms of like, when does this become mainstream? Like, when does that experience that you describe become mainstream? I think it becomes mainstream when Apple makes it mainstream, actually. Mm. So there's a lot of companies working in this space, you know, obviously a lot of noise from Meta, Facebook, Apple, it's to me the the more interesting company to look at because they tend to really drive the cultural change in, mm. in a in a bigger way. If you think back and you remember a time when everyone had flip phones, right? There was a t- yeah. there was a time that we all had flip phones <laughs> and we actually used phones just for making phone calls. And nobody thought they needed a smartphone. Nobody thought that they needed to have uh, you know all these capabilities on their phone. But Apple, you know, created the the uh, the iPhone and they launched it and it was very expensive right you know probably five times more than a flip phone maybe ten times more than a flip phone but as soon as people started using it and realized oh I can access all this other information it became something where you felt like you were at a disadvantage if you had a flip phone and so they had within five years of launching the iPhone they had very very high adoption and the world really was clearly making this transition from flip phones to smartphones. Mm-hmm. I think when Apple launches launches augmented reality glasses, it will be a similar it will be a similar transition. It will be like the launch of the iPhone, because when they launch augmented reality glasses, I think they'll do it in 2025. It will be the same thing. It will be a little bit expensive at first, but you will have access to all this content around you. And if you don't have access to the content, you'll feel like you're missing out on information, missing out on content. And so I think adoption will follow a similar curve. And within five years, by 2030, I think that these lightweight classes that put the information around you will be the way we interact with mobile media. It won't Mm -hmm. be people staring down at a screen. It will be glasses. But I wonder from a dating perspective, you're then going to meet somebody and you're going to be able to see that their heart rate has gone up when you're flirting with them or what have you. Is that the kind of information that we're going to be fed when we're interacting with other people and salespeople? I believe believe we will see that. I mean, there's a lot of things that are both interesting and, and can get creepy. I think people have very serious privacy concerns about that. And so 
maybe people will have to opt in to allow other people to see their their heart rate. But mm -hmm. it's but what you're saying is exactly right, which is it is technically possible that in five years when people are wearing AR AR glasses, they can see the you know temperature and heart rate and respiration rate of of people while they're having conversations. I think when people realize that that's possible, they will demand the ability to opt out, <laughs> opt out of those things. They'll find it intrusive. I, I think- I don't know. There's other people that want everyone to know every little thing about them. It becomes the culture. Will, will it become the culture where people are, are happy to have their heart rate visible to everybody? Uh, or will it become the culture where uh, people want to protect protect that information it's yeah and then do you really want people to know that you find them attractive or repulsive or you know will we, will we be able to know when someone's lying to us with the glass i think we'll have i think we'll, we will have cues like we we could very easily have information presented that tells us the probability that somebody is lying Wow, um, it's creepy. On the other hand, it will drive how culture evolves. Uh, it is the capabilities, and again, it's the combination of these immersive technologies and and AI that will allow these type of behavioral analyses to happen. And hmm. you can imagine all the creepy reasons that people won't want it. And you can also imagine that a culture will evolve where everybody thinks it's just fine. <laughs> I know for some people that have social anxiety, being able to go into these virtual worlds allows them to leave their home without leaving their home. So they have, you know, their cat in their lap and they feel more comfortable interacting with other people in this virtual world. There's a lot of good that can come out of it. Do you think people can make real connections in the metaverse? So I think they can. I mean, I think, I mean, you could ask the same question about social media. Can people make real connections in social media? And, and the thing is social media, it's again, it's mostly flat content and it's also mostly not real time. It's people passing notes to each other. And so the metaverse will, will certainly be more, more intimate in that people, it's real time interactions. It will ultimately be 3D interactions, photorealistic interactions. Uh, and so I do think that people will form more, more realistic relationships and, and friendships uh, when it is immersive, because mm -hmm. it will feel more real. I think there's also the dangers as well, which is you could form realistic, realistic experiences or be drawn into very realistic relationships, uh, but the potential for identity theft and impersonation it actually goes up substantially in the in the metaverse, which is well, sure. So, couldn't I just create an avatar of you and just be, pretend to be you walking so, around? Right. So, so, absolutely. So, this the issue of identity theft in the metaverse is a big concern to me, at least, because again, the way I describe it is, you know, the whole point of of virtual reality and augmented reality is to fool the senses. It's a technology that's designed to blur the boundaries between what's real and what's not real. And if I interact with somebody, I'm relying on the fact that they look and sound the way I expect. But in the metaverse, somebody could hijack or or copy an avatar, even a photorealistic avatar. They could copy the voice and they could sound like you. And in fact, Amazon just announced that they have, that you could make uh, Alexa sound like your dead grandmother and they, with voice emulation, which is creepy. It's a separate creepy issue. <laughs> but but the, the point is that this, you know, voice emulation software already exists and you can basically, you know, sample examples of somebody and then emulate their voice. And so if somebody, you know, if I interact with somebody who looks and sounds like a family member or a coworker, they could be an impersonator. They could be an imposter. They could be trying, right. it could be a phishing attack that's trying to get me to give up bank information or, or it could be a fake coworker that's trying to get me to give up, you know, company secrets. And so there needs to be security around identity in the metaverse that's significantly more robust than what we have in social media. It's a real risk. We're going to really need to know that the person we're talking to is the person that we think we're talking to because the opportunities for fraud uh, or deception or catfishing or uh, any of the things that already happened just become that much more dangerous in, in the metaverse. Oh my God. Are you on Capitol Hill talking to the people that would put these rules in place? So I do, I, I have had conversations with uh, with various governments around the world, uh, the US, the EU, Australia, uh, New Zealand. I'm involved with an, a number of organizations that push hard for metaverse regulation. Uh, one is called the Responsible Metaverse Alliance. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I'm the chief scientist for them. Another is called the uh, XR Safety Initiative. Uh, I'm a, a, the technology advisor for them. And, and all these groups do good work just trying to raise awareness. So people, because it's mostly getting politicians to realize the metaverse is going to give powers to these corporations Mm -hmm. that go far beyond the current capabilities that they have in you know, with say social media like social media companies know a lot about society metaverse platforms will basically be able to just see what everybody is doing and then change the world around them and oh, well it sounds like all you got to do is tell those politicians they're going to be able to determine who's elected for sure <laughs> like what you know so they'll they'll uh, they'll lock that down pretty quick it's the funny thing is that when you talk to politicians, they say like, you know, we can't even figure out how to solve social media. Why should we think about the metaverse? And the answer that, that I give is, well, we waited way too long to, to put guardrails in place in social media and you can't fix it. The biggest companies in the world have, have designed their entire business models around those practices. If you put right, guardrails- It's a new game. So go ahead and create game. the rules for this new game. Exactly. I create the rules for this new game. And then the businesses will create business models and compete on that playing field. My hope is that people learn the lesson of social media, which is by the time anyone thought that there should be some restrictions, it was really too late. I mean, yeah. that, I mean, there's still efforts to try to make social media a safer place for consumers. It's really about consumer protections, but it's it's so much harder because it, there's just a history that you can't undo. Mm. How many people are actually hanging out in the metaverse and all these different platforms right now? And how many do you think are going to be there in the next three years, five years, 10 years? I mean, it's a difficult question because the definition of the metaverse is kind of blurry. Right. Um, and there's really is, it, it, to me, there's this crossover between what you know, call the metaverse and just traditional gaming, right? So yeah. there's a lot of you know gaming platforms that are immersive 3D worlds. You can consider them the metaverse. Some of them are for adults, some are more for kids. Minecraft and Roblox are two right. you know, big platforms for kids that really are very much metaverse-like environments. And in mm -hmm. fact, that generation of kids is already kind of growing up in the metaverse if they're spending lots and lots of time in, time in Minecraft or, or Roblox. Mm -hmm. um, I think that most metaverse activity right now is happening more for the just the socializing experience of it. And so mm -hmm. there's, you know, there's platforms like Horizon World, there's platforms like uh, Second Life, which is kind of the first to become popular. There's a variety of other platforms. They don't have very large user bases, but they have a lot of energy and enthusiasm. And I think most of the people who are participating are the people who are trying to build that space. They're, you know, they're trying to develop products and services that push out that space. So I think... Right. We're, I mean, do we all need to run out and buy plots of land on these? So that's so you bring up another topic, which is selling plots. Uh, so selling plots of land in the metaverse, I think, is ridiculous. Um, okay. <laughs> I, I mean, that's my view. Like, well, I, I do too, I, and I'm happy you're saying that. But I, I was just curious. So go on. Obviously, in the real world, you people buy land and they speculate on land, and and there's you know, there's sayings like location, location, location. You know, good location. Uh, becomes worth more and and people are now using you know nfts to sell land in the metaverse saying oh if you buy this good location you know it's going to be worth this huge amount in the future i, I personally think it's a, it's a scam uh, and i say that because the thing about the physical world is that the space is limited you have a certain amount of space and it, if, when you use it up it's gone in the metaverse the space is unlimited you can make the, uh, you can make a metaverse as large as you potentially want it and then there's, well, people say, well, what if you have a good location? Well, in the metaverse, people could just teleport from one location to another. So any two locations could be next to each other. In the so the, this idea of location doesn't even make sense. And even if you did have location, you could have different layers of content on that same location. So like the whole idea of space means something different in the metaverse. People who think you know, the thing to do is to speculate on land. They're jumping in way too early. It's not clear which platforms will even exist. Most of them will go out of business. Mm -hmm. uh, some will exist. It's not clear even, you know, how location will be valued in the future. I, I think it's just opportunistic developers trying to make money off the metaverse by saying, let's sell land, when instead they should be trying to make money by creating experiences that people want to have. They should be focused on providing value rather than trying to create this artificial market for land speculation that 
just seems like most people are going to lose all their money. And you bring up some valid points that it's not scarce and the location doesn't matter. Right. <laughs> so so what are you speculating on? It, yeah. it's, I think that most people will lose will lose their money. I mean, there might be, you know, some people will get lucky and they'll happen to, you know, have picked the one platform that becomes. And, and uh, the one right. little space that everyone's hanging out in. Right. Yeah. Great. You just happen to find Times Square or something. Right. Exactly. Okay. Something that I think about a lot, and I'm sure other people do too, is technology is moving so quickly. How does an average human even stay ahead? I mean, the other day I bought a dishwasher from a very large nationwide home improvement store, and it took three employees to ring it up. And I realized I'm not living in an area that is branded as a hotbed of intellectual activity, but I really believe that this is what most people are like. They're, uh, the way that they've been able to embrace technology, I would say worldwide, is probably at the level of the three employees I watched try to ring this up. And I asked them, is this a new point of sale system, new software, new computer, like, oh no, we just all get together to do, we like to help each other out. This, These are average Americans and their grip on technology. And then look at what you're doing. And I just find it very alarming as far as the great divide between the average human and how in the world can they catch up? I mean, it's a great point. And I think things change way too fast. It is overwhelming for everybody, for people who follow technology, like myself. I think it's overwhelming that things change as quickly as they do. And I think technology should be making our lives simpler, not making our lives more complicated. And mm -hmm. I think when when they do make things more complicated, if something went wrong, somebody made a mistake. And I think that there are companies that, that do a good job at simplifying the world with technology. And there's companies that do a, a terrible job and make the world more worse. And I think ultimately over time, the products that take off are the ones that simplify simplify the world. Mm -hmm. I think that you know, if you think of the metaverse, it ultimately should simplify the world. Meaning if I just if I have to go into somebody's let's let's go back to your example of you know what a small business could do with in the metaverse mm -hmm. and say, well you could have a virtual showroom. Well, from a user's perspective, if I have to go to a website and it's really hard to navigate and like, and there, you, you know, there was a time when websites were just terribly designed and it was hard to find anything and, and they're better now, but they're still, you know, you have to go through levels of, of menus sometimes to find the content you want. If instead as the, as a user, just, you just show up and walk into their virtual showroom and it's just as if, you know, it's just a natural experience. You didn't have to learn anything to do it. It's just, it's a, it's a natural thing. And I think that metaverse technologies have the ability, the potential to do that. It uh, doesn't mean that they'll, the, the implementations will be good and people will be, you know, won't be overwhelmed. And I think there will be this tendency at first to overwhelm people with content as they're walking down the street and create like, and that's not what people want. I think what people want is they're walking down the street and they, they stop and they look at a tree and they, and you know, they look long enough that information comes up and just tells them, oh, the, the type of tree it is. It, it is an encyclopedia that just happens to come up when it can tell that you're wondering about something. Like that is the type of experience that wouldn't require you to learn anything, but you could imagine experiences that are the opposite. And, and it's why I think that when companies like Apple you know, come out with their augmented reality and virtual reality experiences, they probably will spend you know, pay more attention to the user experience than some of the companies that are that are just more just excited about the technology and not mm. about the user experience. And I think that's the thing that we see with a lot of new technologies is a lot of new technologies are launched by people who just think the technology is cool and don't think enough about what the user experience is, what people really want. And so it takes some time for these experiences to not be overwhelming. But if it takes three people to ring up a customer, somebody made a, somebody made a mistake <laughs> in how that, that cash register was designed. Because all the know, way around. Yeah. The whole process, I thought, oof, right. there's a lot of inefficiency here. You know, I had a similar experience when, uh, when I just recently bought a new car. When I got the car, they said, oh, we should connect your phone to the car because there's, you know, there's this new app that connects the phone and you can turn on the car from your phone and do these other things. And I'm like, I'm never going to do that, but sure, connect the phone. <laughs> right? And, you know, a half an hour later, they're still trying to connect the phone. I'm like, it's, you know what? It's fine. I can turn on the car when I get into the car. Just because you can add a thousand features doesn't mean anybody wants those thousand features. And people just feel overwhelmed by those 
thousand features. That's true. Um, yeah. Is our physical world someone else's metaverse? I mean, it's a great philosophical question. It's it's one of those philosophical questions where you really can't prove that it's not. Mm-hmm. But um, there's a lot of people and philosophers who think you know the world is a simulation, and we're you know we just live in that simulation. Again, you can't prove that that's not the case, but uh, you know my intuition and maybe it's flawed is that that it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that the here world we go, is, folks. Lewis said it is not. So now we have I, I think, the answer. I think the world actually exists. It's not where we don't live in somebody else's metaverse. It is. Now you're on record now. Now we yeah, know. It is an interesting topic to think about. And people will think about it more and more as we create a metaverse. You know, once once we actually create a metaverse that is photorealistic, then we will really start to wonder. <laughs> you know, yeah. How could you not? Yeah. Lewis, what kind of toys did you play with as a kid? I mean, how did it, how did you get to where you are now? I think about everyone else growing up and what they were exposed to, and it's nowhere in the universe of what you have done and how in the world did you get here? I just, I just don't think Tinker Toys made it happen. So I really, you know, the types of toys that I liked really were building toys like Lego or Tinker Toys or uh, Erector sets. And you just made everyone feel really bad. uh, I mean, I. Those were the types of uh, those were the types of toys that that I really did play with and and liked. So I'm dyslexic, and so when I was a kid, like I did, I struggled in school and elementary school, middle school, uh, just because I would reverse things and reverse numbers and reverse words, and that actually is the thing that pushed me towards computers because computer like back, like this was back when you know, nobody had computers, nobody was using computers, and I as a kid started to use a computer kind of like a toy itself, like where like I could start to learn to program computers, like the way I, like just like building with blocks or building with a rector set, I would learn to program with computers. And the reason I liked it as someone who was dyslexic is that if you, if you type something in wrong, it would tell you, right. If you, if you reverse something, it would give you, would say, Oh, syntax error. And you go, Oh, Mm -hmm. I spelled that wrong. And so I think that's what got me into interested in computing technologies early, just because it was, um, it, it was interesting to me. And it also just worked. It worked for me in a, in ways that other things didn't, mm-hmm. but for me, just building stuff, creating stuff is always, it's always been what, what I like to do. I love that you found a way to harness your dyslexia to turn it into a superpower. Like I have ADHD. I am bored all the time. I am always bored. I always have new ideas churning around. So if I just have someone with me to do the boring stuff, like we can, we can make a lot of stuff happen, but (laughs) if I have to file paperwork, forget it. You know, that's going to sit there. There's all these different ways people see the world and we give them names uh, when in the past, like back when people lived in small tribes, that you know the people who had quote ADHD were out doing you know doing all kinds of stuff out in the world, and other hunting. people were you know, <laughs> out hunting or whatever. Yeah. Like, like there's just people are different, and we give names to some of these differences because they make certain tasks harder, but they make other tasks easier. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you fit in with other kids? I feel like I did fit in partly. I mean, it's partly because I was dyslexic for most of my childhood, like, or it was a problem for me for most of my childhood. And I, I learned to work harder than most people to do fine, to do, like I did fine. I worked harder to do fine in school. I felt like a typical, typical person. I, I didn't start to excel in say academics until when I was already in high school, later in high school. So Mm. um, I felt like my childhood was pretty typical but I, I mean, I do know people who were very precocious as kids, like were way ahead of other people as kids. And then I think that creates a, it makes people different because they're already interested in more advanced things than that. Right. I didn't really have that experience. Okay. All right. Well, lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> I love your swarm technology. Absolutely love it. I'm a huge fan. That platform can be applied in so many different ways. And so I'm I'm just going to turn it over to you and just let you go. Sure. So, <laughs> yeah. so my uh, my current company is called Unanimous AI. Uh, founded it, I think, seven years ago. And it's really a different type of artificial intelligence company. Most AI companies are 
you know, use lots of data to replace people, you know, and automate decisions. And what we do at Unanimous AI is use the technology to connect groups of people together and make them smarter in groups and, and allow groups to, to become super experts by connecting them. And the, the technology itself was inspired by nature. So nature, you know, their natural systems have uh, evolved that enable large groups to be smarter together than alone. And so the reason why fish form schools and uh, birds form flocks and bees form swarms is that they're significantly smarter together than alone. And so if you think of a school of fish, it's actually pretty amazing. So a school of fish, it might be thousands of individuals. Nobody's in charge. There's no leader in the school of fish. And yet they can navigate the ocean and live their whole lives, you know, deciding where to go and when to go and what to do and when to, when to feed and when, and, and they're doing that as a system. And biologists call those systems swarms, whether it's a school of fish or a, a flock of birds or, or a colony of ants, swarm of bees, we, we call them a swarm. And so there, there's this idea of swarm intelligence, which is that groups can be really smart if they work together in systems. And so, you know, seven years ago is when, when I founded the company, we said, well, if birds and bees and fish can get smarter in these real-time systems, what if people can do it? And so we built this system that we call Swarm that allows groups of people to connect over the internet from anywhere in the world. And it's uh, this graphical interface where basically people can, you know, questions appear on everybody's screen at the same time and a little glass puck appears and people have these little magnets and they can pull and push the way that a school of fish might pull and push on each other to decide where to go. And we have AI algorithms that watch how everybody's interacting and it allows the swarm to reach an answer. And when we do that, it, it works. It, it significantly amplifies the intelligence of the groups. And so we, you know, we found that uh, we can ask groups of people to predict anything and they become really, really smart. So for example, every, every year we, you know, we, we get asked by reporters to predict the Oscars. And so we'll get a, you know, a group of you know just 50 movie fans and we'll say come into swarm and let's predict you know who's going to win best picture who's going to win best director who's going to win you know best screenplay and these are just regular movie fans but but each of the people has a, has different experience different knowledge different you know they some of the people might have heard something on the radio about some of the movies some might have read something you have a group of people with different knowledge and every year that we do it we this group of just regular movie fans will be you know like 80 like like 89, 90% accurate, like very, very accurate in predicting the Oscars. And they will outperform all of the movie critics. They'll outperform the movie critics for the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, Variety Magazine, Vanity Fair. And the question is, well, people are smart. And if you connect them together with these, in a swarm with these AI algorithms, we can amplify their knowledge and wisdom and insight and intuition. And so it works. And now- What I love about it though, is no one knows who is manipulating that puck to get to the decision. And for a lot of people, they don't know what we're talking about here. So let's try to describe it. Uh, it's a hexagon. So we have it's a hexagon. You know, there we go. But we have, there's a hexagon with different choices at, at each of the nodes. Right. So at say, each point, at each point is the answer. So it's like a multiple choice question, but you push that puck to the answer and people are all working collectively to push that puck to the answer that they say is correct. And your AI can also see when people are hesitant and trying to maybe pull it in a different direction or they see everyone's going in this direction. How hard do they fight to try to move the puck in the right direction? So that's absolutely right. So you can you don't you can almost think of it like a Ouija board, right? Like like a Ouija board, you have you know a few people sitting around a table pushing a, a you know a puck. Here you can imagine it's it's like that, but that you have 50 people or 100 people, they could be anywhere in the world answering a question, you know, who's going to win best picture, or they're predicting, you know, who's going to win this football game, or they're predicting the price of gold, or they're predicting the price of oil, or if a Ouija board has, you know, some magical spirit that's that's helping the group guide the group, you know, our swarm system, it has an AI that's watching everybody's behaviors, and it's it's looking at who's displaying confidence, who's displaying hesitation, and it's allowing the, the swarm to find the answer that's really the best combination of their knowledge and wisdom and insight. And it works, for example, we, and we've done these research studies with various universities to really quantify, you know, does this really work? And so we did a study with, with Oxford University where we had sports fans predict 
uh, soccer games in the English Premier League, which is actually the most popular sport in the world. And so they, we had them predict 50 consecutive soccer games, which you know, took uh, five weeks to do. And so the group would just come together, you know, log in, predict a set of games for that weekend, and then come back the next week and predict the next set of games. Uh, and the amazing thing is that as individuals, when they predicted, uh, they were 55% accurate as individuals predicting the outcome of these different soccer games. But when they worked together as this swarm, they went up to 72% accurate, 72% accurate predicting these games. And they actually beat the, the Vegas odds makers. So had they bet on all those games, they would have actually uh, made a lot of money. In fact, so you're changing uh, the betting industry. So we, we do get deeply involved in sports forecasting. We, we got involved in sports forecasting because it's, uh, it's a great place to test our technology because there's games every single day. Yeah. And so when we first started, we would predict, you know, we predict baseball games, football games. We just put the predictions on our website and people would follow the predictions. And then we decided, okay, we learned everything we need to do. Let's stop doing it. And then people said, well, we still, we still want those predictions. So we actually uh, spun off a business called Sports Picker AI, which is basically an intelligence service that, that puts out sports picks every day. So last season, we predicted every single football game the entire season. Uh, and we keep careful track of how these predictions are doing. And, and what's really interesting is that, so when you're, when you're betting on, say, a football game and you're betting against the spread, you have 50-50 odds of getting it right. And actually, most people who bet get it wrong half the time. And then Vegas takes a few percent. And so you just slowly lose all your money. I guess the vast majority of people just slowly lose all their money by get, being 50% accurate. The best gamblers in the world usually get to up to 55% accurate. So it's, that's, it's a very subtle difference between like an average person and a really good gambler getting up to 55%. And those are professional gamblers. What we do you know, with, with our sports picker AI uh, service is we take groups of sports fans, they come in, they predict they predicted every single football game last season, and they got up to fifty seven percent accurate across the entire season predicting predicting the football season. And so they, you know, had they had they bet on all those games, they would have you know, done really really well, better than a, a professional gambler level. And we see that type of performance when we predict football games, baseball games, hockey games. Uh, we've we've even worked with hedge funds who use the the Swarm platform to predict the price of stocks, predict the price of gold, price of oil, predict the S&P 500. Are, are you and doing anything with the meme stocks? You're getting those people in to weigh in on that? We, we, uh, we actually did. We did a, actually just last year, we did a study with, uh, with Cambridge University Business School focused specifically on meme stocks. We said, can we predict GameStop and, and the other meme stocks? Yeah. And um, and we could. The, the group of, it was a group of their business school students. They'd come into Swarm. They predicted meme, meme stocks, and they were very uh, very successful doing it. Uh, we are now just getting into predicting cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. um, we just we just started a new a new service called uh, Crypto Swarm uh, dot AI. Uh, next month's going to start predicting Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, Litecoin, basically all the major cryptocurrencies to predict uh -huh. the motions uh every 48 hours we'll be putting out sets of predictions so that's it, so exciting uh, and it always amazes me that it that it works we predict these kind of things that are of, of public interest but we have customers who use swarm to predict really important things uh the united nations is a customer that they, they've used uh they use swarm to predict famines around the world and so they oh, have wow. They have groups of experts who uh, who come together and predict. You know, what's the likelihood that there'll be a famine in South Africa over the next eighteen months? And they'll bring together people who are you know experts in in the economy, the climate, uh, politics, and they'll make these forecasts. What I like about it too is from a diversity, equity, and inclusion standpoint, it's giving everyone an equal voice. You're you're not allowing one person to take over and bulldoze the conversation. Everyone gets to weigh in from their perspective and you're allowing gut instincts and perspectives to pull their information together to come up with the right decision. Absolutely. So when, when people come into Swarm, everybody's equal and everybody's yeah. ano anonymous. And so we have a lot of customers who are just businesses trying to make business decisions and uh, and when everybody's equal and everybody's anonymous, they actually reach much better decisions because in especially in a hierarchy, there are people in the organization who are they're just trying to predict what you know what does their boss want want them to say. Yeah, <laughs> and, right. Um, whereas when everybody's equal and everybody's anonymous, now everybody can actually use their intelligence of what they really think the right answer is. 
And so we've uh, we've worked with Fortune 500 corporations. Uh, we have we actually have a project uh, with the U.S. Air Force uh, on decision making. And obviously, you know, the Air Force has very strict uh, hierarchy. You know, being able to allow groups of people to you know, reach the best decisions possible is you know is a great way for businesses to design the best products. You know, design the best marketing messages. And really, you know, any type of you know, decisions you can get more accurate and and have a basically a better representation of the of the knowledge and wisdom and, of and, and insights yeah. contained contained within the team. Well, the applications are endless, and I think about all of these large businesses that went out of business because people obviously were making the wrong decisions. And I wonder if all the businesses today were using your technology, is that going to guarantee that they would be around 100 years from now? Because they're suddenly going to be making the right decisions. One thing that we've really proven through study, you know, we've done studies with with Stanford Medical School, having doctors make diagnoses and get significantly more accurate. We've done studies with MIT, having uh, groups of financial traders make forecasts and get significantly more accurate. The, the thing that we see, you know, every time is that if you take a group of people, we can make them smarter. Smarter meaning they'll make more accurate forecasts, more accurate estimations, more accurate predictions, and better decisions. And by better, we mean decisions that the group as a whole feels like it represents their opinions. Mm -hmm. And so- Yeah, so, so you get more buy-in, right? Because then they see it as it's working. They see it live. They're not waiting for that survey that someone else chopped up and then fed back to them. They're seeing it live. Like, oh, this is where we collectively want to go. Okay, I'm the one person yeah. over here by myself. I'm the little magnet by myself <laughs> in the corner uh, at the, at the and, wrong choice. And that's the thing. You, you use the word buy-in. It's exactly right, which is if you have a group of people and they reach a decision, you know, very often it's a decision that maybe nobody's nobody's 100% happy with, but they understand why, like they understand how the group reached that decision. They feel like they mm -hmm. were part of the decision. Even if it was a decision that wasn't originally what they thought was the right answer, they feel like they were part of it and they have more buy-in as opposed to say, you know, just taking a survey. You know, when, when a company takes a survey and you drop your, you know, your opinion into a black box and then it comes out at the other end saying like, something else you say well you just figure well nobody cared what i had to say um but right, when or maybe or maybe the numbers were manipulated that maybe everyone said something but the person who counted the vote or changed the data i mean there are people that think that as well so but when it's a swarm everybody just everyone experiences the group converging on an answer mm -hmm. uh, and they they have more buy in in the decision they have a better understanding of their team and they almost always reach a more accurate decision. If it's something that you can measure the accuracy of, whether it's a forecast or a prediction, you know, they will have a better decision, more accurate decision, more accurate sales forecast, more accurate inventory forecast if they work together as a swarm than mm -hmm. if they use other methods. I love it too, because it pushes aside ego. So it's no longer about the ego of one person or two people and they want their decision to win that they, they want their idea to win it, it's not really about that are you in, not, are you working with the insurance industry at all because i mean that's all upside down right now auto and home and property actually, and all I, that we haven't worked with the insurance it's a great application it's an area that we definitely have interest in especially you know there's so many interesting things in you know you know actuarial predictions and in, yeah. in the insurance industry. Our experience with the insurance industry has been that they they're slow to change compared to <laughs> some. You got other, that right. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you worked you worked at Geico, right? So you know, yeah, the two industry. decades, mm -hmm. um, almost two decades. Well, it's interesting. You see, some fields are very fast to change. Some fields are very very slow to change. You know, we see we see a lot of interest from financial markets, financial predictions, because those you know that's a world that's looking for every little tiny edge. Lots sure. of interest from digital marketing. You know, a lot of uh, large corporations use Swarm to optimize their marketing messages. Uh, you know, to predict what marketing message will resonate with populations and you know, with groups of people the, the best. Uh, we've done we've done projects with Disney uh, predicting that new television shows that we'd have wow. groups of people would watch would watch a trailer of the new show and then would uh -huh. swarm to so really any application, especially applications where it's really about you know predicting how 
how people will behave or people will resonate with different messages works really, really well. And, and obviously, like you said, predicting horses <laughs> worked, worked right. uh, really, really well too. Uh, every year when I worked at Geico, we had our, our business plan challenge and lots and lots of data and lots of people staring at spreadsheets and graphs and all this kind of stuff. And I would always put this little number. It wasn't a little number. It was a big number as far as what the, the budget would come in at and how many uh, sales I thought my division would get. And I would fold it up and I would put it in this cookie jar and it was based on gut and Uh I could never prove that number on a spreadsheet (laughs) at all. But that number was more often than not closer to accurate than all the data pulled together, looked at all these different spreadsheets, but you can't just stand it there at a business plan and say, well, my gut says this is where we're going to be. So I, I really think that technology harnesses the instincts of people as well and then merges with all those spreadsheets to come up with the accurate answer. I mean, that's one, I mean, the, the core philosophy of at unanimous AI is that people are smart and people are smart in ways that, that go beyond, you know, the pure analytics. I mean, we use these words like uh, instinct, intuition, you know, gut feelings, as if those are less important than rigorous analysis. But instinct and intuition is just your subconscious doing rigorous analysis and <laughs> uh, you know doing pe- the math people's instinct and intuition count for a lot and when you combine the instinct and intuition of a group of people uh, become really really smart mm-hmm. yeah well lewis i think you're doing wonderful things for the world i watched the documentary on amazon with cal penn uh, and it's a really yeah. big title so i i wrote it down because i knew i'd mess it up the giant beast that is the global economy and tracked yeah. you down on there and the reason why is i had an interview with kiki Latalien who apparently interviewed you several years ago. And she was talking about past guests and she's like, this guy was so amazing. And she was talking about Swarm AI. I said, shut up. Are you talking about Lewis Rosenberg? She's like, yes. And so she's a huge fan. And, you know, we bonded over that. I had had no idea, but she mentioned this documentary. So I decided to check it out before our discussion today. And I loved the whole bit about the autonomous vehicles and the ethics and morals behind like the car deciding who dies in a car accident. And so, yeah, I mean, that's pretty mind blowing. And just because you have autonomous vehicles doesn't mean that car accidents completely disappear. There will still come a time when a car accident still happens. And there was something you said in the documentary that just melted my brain a little bit. And that was that some companies could possibly design and sell a car based on the concept that the car would always protect you no matter what. So it would always, always protect you. And that would be maybe something that a consumer would want as a vehicle that always makes sure that they and their family stay alive. You want to elaborate more on that? Yeah, no, so it's, so Unanimous AI, we, we have partnered with some researchers at MIT who are working on something called the Moral Machine Project, which really mm-hmm. gets into this these issues. We humans have you know certain morality when we do things like driving. And when you're driving, you can put people's lives at risk. And if you want to program an automobile to behave morally, what does that even mean? And so the Moral Machine Project, they get into these very strange scenarios where you're driving a car, it goes out of control, you have to turn the wheel, you know, and if you turn one way, you'll you'll hit a group of five people. But if you turn the other way, you'll just hit one person. Like, what's mm-hmm. the moral thing to do? And so almost everyone will say, well, hitting one person. What if this one person is solving, you know, they found the cure for cancer. Now we've killed how many millions of people because the cure to cancer doesn't exist now? I mean, right. how so, do you so know? There's all these, right. There's all, or there's all these like strange moral things that could happen, which is if you happen to know about the people who are involved or three old people versus one pregnant woman. Like, what should you do? Like, you could argue, well, take out the three old people. <laughs> because <laughs> if they, Right. Or you could argue, well, you know, two people is better than one person. Like, you know, say like, oh, we need to put morality into AI. This points out you can't even agree on what morality even means. Who's morality? And, mm-hmm. you know, one of the things that, that I like to say is you know, if somebody programmed an AI 100 years ago, with the morality of the time. Today, we would think it's pretty out of touch. It would, today, we would think it's pretty different. So morality is something that keeps changing and it's different for different people. It's different in different cultures. And yet these issues come up for AI. 
in terms of, especially you know, a self-driving car, like it ultimately could have to make decisions. And one of the decisions, it could be, well, how do you value the life of the driver versus a pedestrian? Right. If, you know, if a driver, well, has, that driver could be a real jerk, you know? Right. Would you rather buy a car that prioritizes the life of the driver over the life of a pedestrian if it had to make that decision? And and like these are the types of moral issues that come up. And, and one of the you know, reasons that I got involved in this with MIT and was on that TV show uh, on Netflix w- was... Well, how do we even know what what the conventional wisdom is of people about these scenarios? And so we use the swarm platform to say, okay, let's let's get a group of people together and make a super driver that would capture the the wisdom of, by having them make these decisions as a swarm. And it's you know these moral issues are really interesting, and they're only going to get more and more significant as as AI becomes part of more decisions. I mean, self-driving cars is is one, but AIs are getting built into all kinds of decision processes. I thought it was interesting when they used your platform and everyone had to decide who dies. So there was a pregnant woman, there were uh, like two doctors and like a girl and a just a little boy. And they're like, little boy, the little boy dies. But whew. Wow, that's the decision. I mean, that's how the society has ranked the importance of everyone in that scenario and the little boy goes. It's really interesting. And one of the things that we've found with Swarm is that when we get a group of people together to make a decision in Swarm, they usually become more selfless as a group than if you ask them individually on a survey. On a survey, people usually are more selfish and in a Swarm, they're more self selfless. And we did uh, we did a project with Fast Company um, a few years ago. This was when I guess Jeff Bezos had had tweeted out asking the public uh, what should you know what should he donate his money to, and mm-hmm. so that like the public was like gave like thousands of different suggestions, and so we brought together a group of people into a swarm. And we had them rate these different suggestions and decide well what would be the best thing to use their money for. And and the people we had were all were all Americans, like they were all in the U.S. And when they did it on a survey, people you know chose things that were very much would affect their own lives, like free healthcare for everybody in America or you know free uh, medications for everybody in America. But when they worked together in a swarm, they actually converged on you know clean water for everybody in the whole world. Oh, wow. And they picked something that actually wouldn't even have benefited Americans because most Americans have clean water. Yeah. But, so it's you definitely have groups of people uh, who, when they come together in a swarm, they make these uh, more selfless decisions. Uh, you know, often, you know, I would describe them as you know, it makes the group wiser. Like they mm-hmm. they're able to think bigger when they're together in a system as opposed to thinking about their own your smaller individual problems. It's so fascinating. I am just so enthralled with you and this platform and all the applications for it. And I hope anyone listening checks out Lewis and his platform and go to Unanimous AI. I cannot say enough great things about it. I want to talk about your 300 patents. I mean, that's ridiculous. That is such a ridiculous number of patents. Is that like the most anyone's ever had? There are probably a few hundred people in the world who have, you know, over, maybe over 200 patents. Is there a club? Do you all meet up? Like, you know. There's no club. Compare, no. <laughs> There is, there is no. You might club. not like each other, actually. <laughs> uh, but most of the patents I have are in the, you know, the fields of virtual reality, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, uh, you know, and they really focus on the types of problems that I spend time thinking about. So, what was your first patent? Uh, the first patent was related to the metaverse in, uh, I think, 1993. A 3D interface for allowing people to interact with uh, spatially with 3D worlds. And so oh, wow. it was it was very much about allowing people, you know, back in 1993, you know, we there was, you know, the mouse existed for interacting with 2D, 2D environments, but there weren't mm-hmm. really tools for interacting with 3D environments. And so uh, I was working on uh, 3D interfaces that allow people to to reach out and interact naturally in immersive environments and also feel what things felt like. And so I spent a lot of time working on a technology area called haptics, which is enabling the sense of touch in computing. And so you could reach out and not just interact with something, but you actually f- would feel like it's really there. Wow. And so that was what I was doing. That was the first, the first patents in the, in the early 90s that I was working on. 
Well, do you have any goofy I, patents? Anything that's kind of silly that you put together that is uh, maybe to the out? goofy, the goofiest one, the one that you probably think was the goofiest. Again, I do a lot of work in the user interfaces, and um, one that I did because I thought it would be really fun for some gaming applications was a magic wand. So it would it's a magic wand that you could use in uh, in virtual reality or augmented reality for different gaming applications that cast a spell probably, or whatever, cast okay. a spell, whatever. Yeah, so that's all a right. Kind of a, that's a, that's a goofy, fun one. I like um, that. All right. Now you're also an author too. You, all right. So you have lots of different books out there, but one of them is called one of us and it's a picture book for adults about AI. I haven't yeah. read it. Does this teach them? So if someone doesn't really understand, I mean, how, how does it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't teach about it. It's, it's more of a, uh, a fable about it's like, it's written as a children's book. It's for adults. And it's really about, you know, what would it be like if you were an AI that suddenly was born in uh-huh. somebody else's lab, and 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 so you, it's so it's really from the perspective of the you know the AI, and it's it's almost like a sort of like a Frankenstein story. It's it's not like creating a monster, but it is you know Frankenstein was brought to life and in, in somebody's lab and uh-huh. didn't necess- didn't necessarily ask for that and had to deal with that. But now imagine instead of it being you know a monster, it was an AI that was actually really smart, as smart as people. And suddenly it's come to life. And, and now it's like, well, what, you know, what do you people do here? What, like, like what, what is, uh, you know, why am I here is the, is, is kind of how this AI interacts. And it's a picture book and it was a great artist was involved and it's kind of fun. You should, you should check it out. It's, I will. Uh, I, I, everyone should. Yep. And you've written some yeah. other books too. Yeah. Uh, I, so some are graphic novels. Uh, I wrote a graphic novel called Upgrade about the metaverse. This was back in 2008 and really about a world where nobody ever leaves their home. They're just, they're always, they, from the moment they wake up, they climb into the metaverse and they spend their whole day in the metaverse and they, and then uh, they go to sleep. And it and it's a dystopian book. It's really you know cautionary tale about the potential dangers of, of the metaverse. And mm-hmm. the really the ironic and kind of creepy thing about Upgrade is that the the reason the world ended up like that in this story, and this is back in two thousand eight when I wrote it, is because of a, a pandemic made everybody afraid to go outside. And so, what? Look at you. So there's a predicting so there's the a, future. There's a pandemic that happens, and in the book, the pandemic happens in the twenty twenties, and it forces everyone to, to use the metaverse, and then they never leave. And so even when the ah. pandemic is over, you know, 20 years later, there are people who've lived their you know, lived their entire life in this virtual world. And the, the story is really about uh, somebody who gets kicked out and has to actually leave the metaverse for the first time and just go out into the real world. And the, oh, wow. the real world is just, it's just empty. And so it is uh, what it would be like for somebody to experience the real world for the first time. Yeah, it, it's a, I love that. It's, I'm definitely gonna have to read that. So was AI sentient? Uh, so right. So there was a, a story in the news a couple of weeks ago. An engineer from Google claimed that their AI was sentient. He had conversations with this AI and believed it was sentient. It wasn't sentient. <laughs> so so I mean, and, and but it's still a really interesting story. It's a really interesting story because it shows how easy it is to fool people into thinking something is sentient. Uh-huh. And, and what this AI is, it, you know, the AI at Google is what's called a, lar- a large language model. It's trained by having this AI process millions and millions of documents. It, it knows you know, when there's a particular question, what are the most likely answers to that question? What are the most likely words to follow other words? And so it's really statistics. It's this massive statistical model. And so it can answer questions that seem that are, A, it gives you good answers, and it seems very human, but it's not sentient because it has no understanding of what it's saying at all. It, it has, it's giving an answer, but it has no understanding of what it says. Uh, what it really is really good at doing is taking this massive database of millions and millions, probably hundreds of millions, maybe billions of documents, and boiling it all, da- all down to a reasonable, smart answer. But it's statistics, it's not it has no understanding. It's not sentient, but we humans are very easily fooled uh-huh. uh, into feeling like you know something we interact with is is sentient when it's responding that way. Yeah, I read somewhere about them using that application to help someone who's grieving, 
and that they mm -hmm. could then continue to talk to the person that they lost because AI could then, you know, get their voice and they could respond. Are you, are you familiar with this at all? Like, yeah. So there's this whole kind of new industry called like digital afterlife, which is kind of a <laughs> creepy, creepy term. But the idea is that they could digitize or, or replicate or simulate a, uh, a person's loved one and you could then interact with a, a dead loved one. It's I, I imagine it could be helpful for if somebody's grieving. It can also, I could imagine, lead to all kinds of strange psycho psychological problems where you yeah. where you think you're deal you're interacting with the actual person, but you're not. It's not the person. It's not a representation of the person. It is just a crude model that you know, could look and sound real, mm -hmm. but it has again, it can't think. You can't feel it's just you're responding. Right. There was an episode on Black Mirror. Have you ever seen that show? Black I've seen Mirror. the show. I have not I have not seen that episode though. Yeah, this woman, she lost her husband. And so then she ordered pretty much it was a robot, but it was it looked like a human. It looked just like her husband. And he interacted right. with her and everything else, you know, with her. But then eventually she just put him up in the attic. She just didn't want to deal right. with him anymore. It was <laughs> weird. Plus, it wasn't aging while she was. And so that right. was you know, odd as well. It was very sad. You know, there was this kind of, kind of like a living, it seemed like sentient creature upstairs in this attic right. because she just didn't want to deal with them anymore. And she couldn't obviously kill them, you know, a second time. Speaking of sentient beings, I, I read uh, recently that the United Kingdom ruled that octopus are sentient. Yeah. I mean, so octopus are really interesting creatures because their brains are so different than humans whereas you mm -hmm. know like most organisms we think of have you know a single central brain where the octopus has a distributed brain that's kind of distributed throughout their whole body and yet they are very smart and all kinds of research studies have shown that they're some of the smartest creatures there are i mean there's there are certain creatures that always uh kind of come out on top you know obviously you know people know dolphins and whales come up come out mm -hmm. very smart primates apes and monkeys but what people don't realize is that you know certain birds uh, ravens and crows come out as some of the smartest creatures and then octopus yeah, i read somewhere i think it was i think it was a raven maybe it's a crow holds a grudge like forever yeah. like it's really do you know i don't know if you remember which one i don't know i've heard like there's all kinds like, of crazy stories about ravens ravens will hold grudges they they will if somebody feeds them they'll come and leave them presents um, wow. they, uh, ravens in, I think in Japan have learned that like certain acorns, they couldn't, you know, they can't open them. So they learned to leave them in the street. So cars would drive over them and crack them open for them. So yeah, super smart. Um, now you're a vegan and you've been a vegan yes. for decades. Yeah. So what led you to that lifestyle? Yeah. I mean, ultimately I felt like if I had to kill a cow myself to eat it, I probably wouldn't, like, I wouldn't feel good about it. And so the fact that, you know, there's an industry that hides that from me isn't, uh, you know, isn't the reason that I should do that. My wife's a, a veterinarian. And so she also deals with, you know, she deals with animals all the time. And mm -hmm. um, she has, you know, brought lots and lots of animals in, into our house. So, so we were vegan for a while. And then when our daughter turned 12 years old, she, she said, oh, like, she'd like to start an animal rescue. She was 12. So we we're like, okay, whatever. Yeah, do, do, do whatever. And so she created a website, whatever. And, and she suddenly started getting animals and, and raising money. And she built it into a large animal rescue that now there's 200 animals here. And uh, so you live amongst two hand. All right. So let's talk about these animals. Uh, so the animal sanctuary, it's called Happy Hen Animal Sanctuary. It's, in, uh, it's out here in California. Mm -hmm. But there's hundreds of animals. There's chickens, ducks, geese, pigs, turkeys, cows, goat, sheep. I mean, it's a zoo. <laughs> it's a good, uh, <laughs> so, it, so you think back all those years ago when your daughter says, hey, I'd like to save some animals. You're like, okay. So you thought there might be a chicken that showed up? Yeah. I mean, certainly I really didn't predict like, 200 animals. Yeah. I know it was, I, I didn't think any animals would show up, honestly, <laughs> but, but she really made it happen. And then my wife, who's a veterinarian got involved and, and now together run this sanctuary. They've got employees and it's a big operation. With a lot, I mean, 200 animals, is a lot of animals. To, yeah, it is. Yeah. And yeah. Do, do, can people come and pet the animals or see them? I mean, or is this more of a private enterprise? It's, I mean, it's more of a, I mean, it's a private sanctuary, but 
they they do give tours for people who want to come see the see mm-hmm. the animals and and hear their stories. The, and these are all animals that were rescued from various bad situations. Um, uh-huh. I've bonded with I, I mean bonded with a lot of the animals, but I uh-huh. I mean I like the pigs. I like the pigs the best. The pigs are really smart. I mean that's the thing. Like you spend time with these animals and you realize that they're not any different than say dogs or cats. I mean pigs are absolutely just as smart as as dogs. They, they have a different personality. Like mm-hmm. you know, dogs are trying to please you and pigs are more stubborn. And since they weigh hundreds and hundreds of pounds, you can't really budge them. But they are uh, they are really smart. And you know, other animals that you don't think of being smart, like turkeys, also really smart. Like they'll uh-huh. recognize you. They'll come sit on your lap. I mean, they, um, yeah. And so it's, when you spend time with these animals, you realize they really, you know, they have a whole society going on. And mm-hmm. it's- So moving into the heavy pet peeves segment, what are your pet peeves? What are my pet peeves? When you pull up at a traffic light and, you know, late at night and there's nobody else around, for miles and miles and you're just sitting in a red light like, like there's no reason for that like we have the technology to solve that I think there's some places that do solve it but like the amount of time people waste sitting at a red light when there's just you're the only person is a very simple technological problem that should have already been solved everywhere <laughs> I love that what were you afraid of as a child and what are you afraid of now when I was a kid I was afraid of sharks because uh my parents probably my parents took me to see Jaws when I was too young to see Jaws, I think. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm I definitely afraid, afraid of sharks. sharks. <laughs> I was so I was afraid of sharks. And I grew up in New York, and there really weren't sharks in the like in the water there. But I was still afraid. There now are now. Cal- did you see? Did you see there oh, having yeah, all these shark changed. attacks up there? Yeah, so it's now it's becoming changed. a thing. So now, so now it's become a thing. But back then yeah. it wasn't a thing. Uh-huh. Uh, but I was. So that's what I, I was afraid of. So what are you afraid of now? Besides. Um, all of the privacy issues in the metaverse. <laughs> yeah, so we've talked about a lot of things I'm afraid of <laughs> from uh, from privacy interest issues in metaverse. Uh, I would say I'm still afraid of sharks because because <laughs> now I live in California and I live uh, you know very close to the ocean and in a place where there are shark attacks and I'm like, how does anyone go swimming in the ocean? It might. My son surfs and I'm like, I feel like how do you how are you not afraid of sharks? But I'm with you on that. I'm so afraid of sharks. Okay, now we're going to move into a few questions from the very interesting game show. And as a reminder, no politics, no religion, no ad nauseum topic du jour. And I'm looking for the most ridiculous and interesting and creative answers. So number one, scientists have figured out how to unboil a hard cooked egg. What else should they figure out how to undo? You know, when you like accidentally pull the string out of a hoodie or or sweatpants. Yes. It would really be nice if they figured out how to undo that because that is that is a real <laughs> task to get the string back into the hoodie. A chopstick. Just so you know, a, a ch- chopstick works. You just kind of yeah. push the little rope on a chopstick and just push that through. That's what I do. Uh, next up, mosquito repellents conceal you instead of repelling mosquitoes. What other repellents should be invented? So I mentioned earlier that I had recently bought a new car. And uh-huh. uh, I was definitely thinking that when you show up at an auto dealer and you're just looking around the lot, it would be very nice to to not have salespeople swarm you. <laughs> and so a, a, a salesperson repellent uh, would be a, a a good thing, especially just especially for if you're just trying to browse at a uh, car dealership. Well, yeah, but now in the future, AI is just going to force you to buy that car anyway. So that's right. Yeah. yeah, Money will just jump out of your wallet. You'll just own this car. Okay. Snakes can swallow things larger than their heads because they have flexible jaws. What do you wish was extra flexible and what would you do with that ability? If you've ever been at like the grocery store and there's like you're in line, there's somebody who's who's just crowding you from behind in line, like maybe they're bumping into you with their cart. If your head could spin all the way around and glare at them, I think they, I think they would back off. If, uh, <laughs> oh, that's a really good skill. Yeah, people are always crowding my space at the grocery store. I can't stand it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Okay. And the last question of the day, which is asked on every episode, what should have been invented by now? As somebody who works, you know, a lot in AI, and there's, you know, all these kind of amazing technologies. The one that I keep thinking would will happen and hasn't happened yet is a you know, a translator for pets, where uh, an an AI can can 
really tell you what your what your dog is saying when it barks or what your cat is saying not, and not just from its barks but from its you know posture and in its behaviors but uh, I feel like it should have happened already and I suspect it will happen but some kind of translator for pets I think would uh would be really fun and it would also make people realize that that there's a lot going on inside uh inside the heads of their their dogs and cats and yeah and, and your farm creatures. oh my goodness how yeah. noisy would that be you know what everyone's yeah. thinking <laughs> Yeah. What if, yeah, they're what all if thinking, you find out, what are they thinking? I would say they're, they're, they're all thinking, uh, go get us more food. <laughs> you just hear that. <laughs> yeah. Go what if you find food. out your cat is really annoying or your dog is really annoying? Like, gosh, I thought you were so cute, but oh, I don't want to hang right. out with you. Or you anymore. find out that they, you find out that they don't like you. Like, <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> like you, everyone thinks like, like your, your dogs give you unconditional love. Well, oh, no, we, no, they, no, I just want you to feed me, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Rosenberg. I really appreciate it. How else can folks get in touch with you? If you want to find out about, you know, uh, my company, Unanimous AI, we're just at unanimous.ai. Lots of interesting stuff for, for businesses and, and also for people who uh, are sports fans, want sports predictions, lots of, lots of stuff there. Um, and then for me, Personally, I'm on LinkedIn. People can just find me as uh, Lewis Rosenberg on LinkedIn. And then do you have any last words of advice to the listeners about the metaverse and evolving with technology? I think the metaverse, uh, like all technologies, uh, you have has really amazing potential to make people's lives magical, magical in remarkable ways, creative ways. Uh, entertaining ways. A at the same time, I think consumers should demand that these technologies are are safe, uh, and especially safe in terms of protecting consumers from the really large tech companies that will control them. These technologies have the potential to be invasive, to violate privacy, to be manipulative. And if consumers demand that they don't do that, then companies won't. Thank you so much. That is yeah, no, really, fun. I really appreciate it. And everyone I know that listens to this is going to learn so much. You covered so many interesting topics that, you know, some of it's really alarming and some of it's very exciting. How do we keep the positive <laughs> and rein yeah. in some of that other stuff. All right. Well, see you next Friday at 11, 11 a.m. Eastern. Go forward, my friends. Be interesting. Mm -hmm.